So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, welcome everyone to our part two session on dispelling myths, um, spiritual and sexual abuse. Um, and this is a Q&A with Sheikh Khaled Abu Fadl. Um, I'm so excited to engage in another really important conversation. Um, I hope that people have had a chance to watch our first um, session um, on this really important topic. Um, we um, you know, definitely broke some ground in discussing um, just the foundations in terms of defining spiritual and sexual abuse um, and, you know, uh, some of the issues, of many of the frequently asked questions and misconceptions that um, we have been facing in the Muslim community. Um, clearly, um, the issue of sexual and spiritual abuse has become really pervasive in our community. And we felt very strongly that this is a topic that really, it's so dark, it really needs some light shed on it. Um, we really wanted to have the opportunity to um, ask some, you know, really important questions um, with Sheikh Khaled Abul Fadl. Let me start by, um, if you're new to Usuli Institute or new to this session, uh, my name is Grace Song. I'm the executive director of the Usuli Institute. And um, we are here today with Dr. Khaled Abul Fadl. He is the distinguished professor of law at the UCLA School of Law, where he teaches a number of courses, um, particularly uh, relevant to what we are covering today, um, Muslims, race and law, human trafficking, Islamic jurisprudence, human rights, public international law, and a number of other courses. So um, his expertise uh, covers a broad range um, that is exactly pertinent to the topics that we'll discuss today. Separate from that, he was also the chair of the Islamic, uh, sorry, chair of, the, well, he was chair of the Islamic studies um, um, uh, interdepartmental um, uh, program for many years, uh, but he was also the uh, head of the student conduct committee, which um, was responsible for adjudicating cases of rape and harassment across the entire UCLA campus. So um, he notably had shut down a fraternity for many cases of abuse um, against uh, fellow co-eds. Um, so he has a lot of experience uh, directly in that area. And then with regards to the Islamic community, um, he regularly gets inquiries um, and is working with um, victims of abuse. So um, this is a, a, an area that, um, you know, we, we have a lot of experience in. Um, and uh, so there's, there's a lot to be addressed. Um, I wanted to uh, just in, in, in full transparency, once again, um, you know, in, in part one of our discussion, um, we know that this is a really sensitive topic and it's difficult to um, ask some of these questions. So what we did is we started by identifying uh, with a group of us what would be sort of the most important questions from a priority perspective. And we recruited volunteers to ask those questions on behalf of you know, um, people who would want to know the answers. And so we've done that again. Um, we have curated um, a number of important questions that we didn't get to in part one. Um, and so again, I have a, an amazing team of volunteers who um, you know, are going to be asking questions of the sheikh. Um, the sheikh is not familiar with what these questions were. So it's, it's a cold question for him. Um, but inshallah, you know, these are, um, you know, these are difficult times and, um, you know, we have become aware through our own work just how many people are affected um, by abuse and, um, you know, it's such a taboo topic, particularly in our community that it doesn't get necessarily the right um, attention um, and certainly it's, it's difficult to um, address it honestly um, with bravery. And to get actually, you know, real insight. So it's a it's an opportunity for us. It's a blessing to really um, ask these questions of Sheikh. Um, and um, so our hope is really that this will continue to our uh, to grow our collective uh, understanding. Um, inshallah, help people get some clarity, um, some strength, some uh, enlightenment and empowerment, um, so that we can, you know, hopefully um, help people on this healing journey. Uh, again, I just really want to emphasize part one was really stunning. So if you haven't watched that, um, that is a, a really important prelude to this discussion as well. And our, our goal, inshallah, also is to publish um, the, the proceedings, the questions and answers from both sessions. So that will be another useful tool for people um, who, who uh, are on this journey and need this, this information. So let me begin. Um, I just wanted to um, start by talking about an issue that um, certainly is huge in our community at large, not just the Islamic community, but you know our, our societal community. And that is the issue of pornography, um, because this is clearly something that has not uh, that that has grown um, and, and is pervasive in our time. 
um, and it's something that, um, you know, there are a lot of people that deal with um, addiction when it comes to pornography, but we've also become aware of its use as a tool in the process of, you know, grooming people um, for abuse, um, you know, unfortunately within families and so forth. And, and I know that this is something that has just become more and more prevalent. So I wanted to begin by, by asking Sheikh um, if you wanted to just, um, you know, again, start with kind of your, your thoughts on, on where, where we are as a community, um, but then also have an opportunity to just share some of the things that you've been finding in your work and in your, um, you know, um, counseling of, of people who have been in these horrible abusive situations. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Muhammad ya Rabbi. If I uh, actually, if I, if for those who are online and if you are comfortable, if you're not comfortable, it's quite okay. But if, if you're comfortable, you can turn your camera on. Uh, it's always helpful to, to feel that you're talking to actual human beings uh, rather than just um, uh, names but if for whatever reason because also this is a sensitive topic if you're not uh, don't worry about it um the, 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 the pornography i mean this is such a it's a huge topic because it, it has many different um layers to it so there, there is a, a profound, um, what can I say? Um, there, there a profound uh, social dysfunction uh, about this topic because uh, while in various societies uh, we have recognize the importance of uh, con of of controlling of intervening of limiting of perhaps even censoring uh, certain types of speech like the speech that espouses terrorist attacks um, sometimes we even abuse the concept so the, unpopular speech like speech that is pro-Palestinian. Uh, companies are very comfortable censoring it. Um, pornography still has this status um, where it, it, it's, a, it's a, I would say, a, a liberal hangup that makes systems, political systems, extremely reluctant to touch pornography uh, because supposedly it is uh, a matter of freedom of speech, right? Uh, but it is so multifaceted and it, it, it has, a, it plays a, a, a very, has many different negative levels of impact upon our society. Um, so pornography and human trafficking, this is a, a very big topic. Um, the number of people who are groomed um, after being trafficked to feed into the pornography industry. Uh, pornography and child abuse, that's a different matter. Uh, pornography and the loss of social values and the deterioration of the family unit, that's another big topic. Uh, because a lot of kids uh, who um, are taught that they must be independent very early on in life, too early, and are taught that they're, that um, they, 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 uh, the, the family unit has deteriorated, uh, find, them, find themselves, uh, find it much easier to accept the idea that 
you make a living through the, the pornography industry. But the part that I think Grace most has in mind and the part that I think concerns us the most is the growing problem in Muslim societies of pornography uh, and incest, pornography and sexual abuse. Um, so much of pornography, and this is quite purposeful, this is not um, you know, just happenstance. It's so much for pornography now, there's a whole genre that focuses on incest narratives. Um, brother and sister, father and daughter, uh, uncle and daughter. Um, and a sign of illness in society that these types, uh, this type of pornography is extremely popular. And sadly, um, especially in societies that, I mean, I'm talking about the, my experience with the Muslim societies, that it, it, um, the rate of consumption of this type of pornography is extremely high. And in close societies and in societies where marriage is often um, uh, delayed. Um, this pornography, uh, it, it plays a direct, this type of pornography plays a direct role in uh, incidents of incest um, and sexual abuse within the family. There's another aspect that no Muslims, no, as far as I know, I, I have not seen any Muslim uh, take this issue head on uh, or even acknowledge that it exists. Um, since, since the invasion of Iraq, there has been a type of pornography that has become extremely pervasive and that is uh, the hijab or Arab fetish. So apparently in all por major pornographic sites now, um, in the same way that you have a uh, black category for pornography, Hispanic category, you have Muslim or Arab category. And sadly, what we are discovering that in a lot of Muslim societies, um, when either pornography obtained through boyfriend, girlfriend scenario, so the normally it is a type of pornography filmed with uh, the woman unaware that it's being filmed or in sexual abuse situations um, within families that this abuse, this sexual, these sexual assaults are filmed and loaded onto certain websites. And, and I'm not sure if, the, if they get paid for loading this material. I'm not sure what people get off or get from loading this type of material. But it, it is now doc, well documented, interestingly, by non-Muslim researchers um, that societies like Bangladesh, Egypt, Pakistan, Jordan, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, it, it's all endemic. It, it has reached, a, 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 it has reached a, 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 the level of a pandemic in these societies. And um, that then this type of pornography feeds into further acts of abuse. That the people who consume this pornography then commit abuse either against uh, servants or maids in their household, uh, hired help in other words, uh, often young women or young girls uh, who are li living in the household and serving in the household or in incest type uh, situations. And because there are numerous taboos in Muslim societies, uh, there's a considerable amount of silence. I am not, uh, no researcher, as far as I know, uh, has studied the impact of this type of pornography upon Muslim societies in the West. Um, but I suspect just from anecdotal experience, in other words, people who have talk to me because they were the victims of sexual abuse. 
in incident after another. What I keep hearing is uh, my father, my uncle, my um, stepfather, my even brother um, got the idea from watching this type of material and either tried to get me to watch it or just simply, yeah. So, it, I, and I'm, how I mean it, it is. It's one thing when when you when you when you spend a great deal of time studying the impact on the victims. So it, it, you are you are reading what the effects are on the lives of these people who are involved in these videos long afterwards, ten years down the road, twenty years down the road. Uh, but. In the Muslim community, I, there's no discussion, there's no learning, and so there are no serious impediments other than fear of God. But, uh, but it, it, I get the impression that it, it is very widespread, um, that it has affected many homes, affected many marriages. Um, I, I have never, I mean, it, I, of course, the, the context in which it always uh, it comes to me is that it, it has created devastation upon families and devastation upon marriages. Um, yeah. So part of, um, just to take a step back, I mean, I think part of what we really wanted to achieve through a QA, and a I know, first of all, is, is to shine light on, you know, some of these really dark areas. Um, and, you know, we, we take a lot of pride at, at the Sui Institute in talking about controversial issues, um, because as, you know, we emphasize in all of our work, it's important for us to be fully engaged with our world, with, you know, problems and issues. We should not shy away from very typical and controversial topics. And certainly, you know, we're very interested in helping people who are suffering, um, especially when this is not a topic that you can just go and talk to anyone about. And oftentimes the, the direction that you get you know, whether um, at the mosque or, or elsewhere um, can often be um, misguided and difficult. So on the one hand, we want to just shine light on these issues and, and make these issues, you know, front and center. Um, but secondly, we also do want to address, you know, from, a, from an Islamic legal perspective, um, you know, what is actually um, a misconception versus what is right, you know, what, what, is, um, what is it supposed to be, you know, because a lot of times people weaponize um, Islamic law um, and take advantage of people's mis, you know, mm -hmm. either lack of knowledge or, or um, you know, to, to, you know, promote or, or continue suffering, um, you know, and wrongly so. Um, so that's why with the issue of pornography, I wanted to ask this question because, you know, it's become clear to me in our work that this is an area that no one is really talking about. It's extremely pervasive. People use pornography for all different kinds of reasons. I've even heard, you know, people, um, you know, in the Muslim, uh, you know, we, we actually had a conversation with Rami Yusuf where he would say when he was a teenager, this was his means for dealing with, you know, not doing something bad, you know, as a, as a teenager, but actually just keeping it in his room. And, you know, and that actually leads to all kinds of other issues. And so this is, you know, we live in a modern world with a lot of very complex, you know, topics and issues. And, and when we're hearing also the role of pornography in, in abuse, it's important to highlight it and just to let people know that this is something that we should talk about. We should do research in, we should, you know, um, as, as Muslims at the cutting edge of ethics, um, not be afraid to tackle this type of issue. Um, so, so thank you for for that. Um, let let me let's bring it back. I mean, I know that really our our primary focus was um, to talk about these misconceptions when people are dealing with um, Islamic authority, you know, and legal authority. And so, um, let me uh, turn it over to our our first question, um, which is Sara. Um, and let's uh, you know we're going to move it back into um, the, the area of, of that misconception of abuse. So, Sarah, go ahead. Alaikum, Sheikh. Um, so my question is, in the face of allegations of sexual or spiritual abuse, from a legal Islamic standpoint, how should the public, um, what is the obligation of the public when interacting with the accused? 
So for example, inviting them to lead prayers, um, promoting their work, um, product, buying his books, listening to his uh, reflections and talks, etc. cetera. Um, okay, there is, uh, I don't know if, if this was, um, Sarah, before I, I get to the heart of your question though, I, I wanna just say that the um, the worst types of um, because we we don't have venues for transparency and because we uh, are as a community we have not acknowledged a lot of the realities that surround us some of the worst examples that I've heard uh, for people suffering um, sexual abuse within families, especially, is going to the going to an imam. And uh, in in one example, um, an imam told um, a person in this situation, "Well, unless you can bring four witnesses, then you should basically stay quiet." Um, another different person. Uh, told the woman where your Islamic obligation towards your father is set uh, to basically protect his reputation, protect his honor. And that Allah, that Allah didn't expose him, so you shouldn't expose him. And this is, these are examples of precisely the, the, the worst type of advice that Imams can give. Um, uh, and we could we we could you know uh, talk in in detail about about what's Islamically wrong with this type of advice, but um, but uh, sort of to to the question that you've. Ask because it raises a number I mean, similar, but um, it is definitely true that the presumption of innocence is important. It is relevant, but we must di di differentiate between a legal institutional response where a presumption of innocence protects a person from the an unfair application of a criminal penalty. And in systems of law, there are very structured rules for how you bring an accusation, how you prove an accusation, how you defend against an accusation, and how ultimately you obtain a conviction or not obtain a conviction. But this is quite different when we are negotiating our social responsibilities and the way that we want to deal with uh, the commission of a fahisha. If a fahisha is a is a, a, a moral, morally wrong act, something that is, uh, um, what can I say, um, a, a, something morally evil and um, bad, especially in, in sexual things. Um, Society has a responsibility to create safe spaces for potential victims to air out their grievances. If we are not in the context of a system of law that can try a person and convict a person, that doesn't mean that then that, that doesn't mean that we are 
um, we cannot reach any type of judgment, social judgment, about a person with a repeat offender status. So put it this way, if I have a person who has, let's say, a respectable reputation in society, in other words, they have, they, 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 they have credibility, they, they appear to be of good moral character. The more public the person is, the more impact this person has upon society, the higher the standard that I expect from this person to meet. So the less public you are, the more private you are, the less influential you are, the standards that you are expected to meet in public judgment are, are, would be quite low. In other words, people don't have a right to reach any type of judgment about what you do or not do. But the more public your role, the more you influence others, because Allah tells us in Surah Al-Nur that those who love Yuhbuna, uh, um, um, that those who Allah warns us against tolerating al fahisha in society, against putting up with al fahisha in society. And in order to prevent the spread of fahisha in society, that means that for those who play a public role, those who influence a greater number of people, the, the higher the standards of moral conduct that they must meet. Now, if I have a single accusation against, an unverified accusation against a person of a public, that plays a public role, I might reserve judgment, and I normally reserve judgment. It, but a repeat offender for me is, so, and this is based on some fatawa that a, a person who is accused three times by, um, Anyway, it has an evidentiary basis in, in um, medieval law, but anyway. So if er, three accusations er, is a repeat offender. If someone has that status of a repeat offender, then I want to insulate them from influencing society and from having an impact upon people. It, it is not... It is not that I am saying that you are to not be forgiven by Allah. This is Allah's business. It is not, I am not even saying that I am conclusively convicting you or not convicting you of something. But what I'm saying is that there are what we call wajibul ahtiyat. There is a duty of, of precaution. Now that I've had cumulative evidence, meaning three, you know, the first I might overlook, the second I, I pause, the third, now I have wajibul ihtiyat as kitten, the duty of precaution. So because of the duty of precaution, it means that I am an, under an obligation to limit your influence upon others because now I have repeated complaints. The, the fallacy that often people fall in will say, well, what right do you have to judge me? I am not deciding whether you are guilty in Allah's eyes or not. What I'm deciding is, is that I have potentially hazardous material in the form of a human being who influences others. So it is my obligation to limit the influence, which means you have to affirmatively act to neutralize the, the potential for harm on other people. Now, you know, whether, whether you read their material or not, so let's say someone has, you know, accused us and they've published a lot of work. That is your own personal judgment with Allah, whether you actually believe the accusations or not believe the accusations. 
But even if I, even I, even if I do not believe the accusations, and as a result, I continue reading this person's books and continue learning from this person, I have an obligation towards the public. Even if I don't believe the accusations, I still have an obligation because now enough evidence has been created to kick in the gradual FTR, to kick in the duty of precaution for me to not facilitate the possibility, because if I am wrong, even if I don't believe the accusations, and it turns out I am wrong, and it turns out that someone got hurt because I was wrong, and I facilitated the contact of this person with potential victims, I am responsible for Allah. Especially if Allah tells me, you know what? you allowed your own bias, your own feelings towards this person to enable the person to continue perpetuating harm. This element of, often people get very confused when they say things like, well, you know, uh, I, why should I, I will only pre act to, effectively insulate the harm that could come from a person only if his, only if I believe that they're guilty. You affirmatively might not have enough evidence to either decide even for yourself whether a person is guilty or not, but that's a separate matter from your obligation to protect others. It's like, you know, if you have a, a driver who you hear is a, could be reckless, they lose their temper. And when they lose their temper, they become reckless. I go and I ask this driver, is it true that when you lose your temper, you become reckless? And they say, no, it's not true. But then someone comes and says, you know, I'm thinking of riding with this person. it would be irresponsible of me and poss possibly culpable of me to say, no problem, go ahead and ride with this person. Don't worry. Because I have enough grounds to suspect that this is an unsafe driver. That's the difference because this issue often gets confused in the mind of people. You are not an adjudicator. You are not a trier of fact. You are not a court of law. But you don't have to be to have an obligation to protect others. And this must be very clear in our minds. That's really um, such an important distinction because it feels like we, we, we get confused when like we feel like our sense of, you know, this makes sense to me, I, I don't feel comfortable. And then someone might push back and say, yes, but Islamic law says you cannot be that way. No, let me give, me give you an example. In, in school, in law school teaching, right? We have certain requirements for people who teach first year law school. It's a certain type of professor that can handle first year law school. Why? Because they're very big classes, because these are people who have, this is their first year in law school. They require a special type of diligence and effort to get them to learn a great deal, uh, a great amount of, a lot of material in, in, a, in a short span of time. Now, every once in a while, we get professors where there are complaints by first year law students that they are racially insensitive, uh, gender insensitive. We, now, upon the existence of a certain number of complaints, Institutionally, the decision will be, be made to not allow this professor to teach first years. Although, when, 
we don't decide upon the guilt of this professor. We don't, tell, when the professor objects, we say, we are not saying that the students are actually right. We're not saying that you're a racist. We're not saying you're a sexist. But we're, what we're saying is, is that now the institution has an obligation to act cautiously. So we will not allow you to teach first years because enough of a threshold has been reached to say we must act with caution. When people think, you know, the, the issue of bringing four witnesses, this is in the context of a court of law in which you have a formal accusation, a formal defense, a formal evidence, and a trier of fact. Allah didn't command us to turn our lives into courts of law, especially when we have no jurisdiction to hold the court of law. Who's going to decide whether these are credible, whether it, these are credible witnesses or not? Who's going to decide whether you are fulfilling all the different rules of procedure that would apply in this situation or not? Did Allah truly expect us to keep, to, to allow al fahisha to spread and to allow harm to spread just because we can't turn our living lives into courtrooms, it's, it's nonsensical. It's entirely irrational. When Allah says that he taught us it's kitab wal hikmah, kitab is the book, but there's hikmah. Hikmah is wisdom. We are under obligation as Muslims to reconcile revelation with reason. Whenever revelation stuns and, and paralyzes reason, we have a problem. Whenever reason paralyzes revelation, we have a problem. But that is why precisely the role of wisdom, of hikmah, is to know how to strike this balance. Let me put it differently. The seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, so many situations, so many situations. We read in, in the Sira, well, this is not in the Sira of Omar ibn Khattab, for instance, that he received complaints about such and such governor and he removed them. Khalid ibn al Walid, the greatest military leader in Islamic history, was retired and put on the sideline. Why? Because of accusations. Khalid ibn walid defended himself. And he said, it's not true. And Omar ibn al-Khattab said, I believe you, but I have an obligation to remove you from your post. Although ultimately, Khalid ibn walid could have said, well, how dare you remove me from my post when no, nothing has been proven against me. But the obligation to protect the public is separate and apart from the adjudication of guilt and actual conviction in the court of law when we are talking about criminal procedures. The Prophet والسلام, would hear that it, assigned, I forgot the name of the tax collector, assigned the tax collector to a tribe. The Prophet had full trust in the man. The tribe complained, and I, knowing who, this is a, 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 the, the possibility that the tribe was truthful in saying that he uh, stole our money. That's what they accused him of. For me, as a, as a Muslim, I, I would not believe it. The, this companion could not have been guilty of that. Nevertheless, the Prophet ﷺ removed them from the post. Although, and, and told them, I don't believe the accusation. I don't, I'm not saying you're guilty. You, you're actually culpable of what he, they accused you of. But now there is an obligation 
because for so that the Islam will be improved, I need to put a governor who is more acceptable to them. It's separate and apart, you know, and what we often law is exploited as the handmaiden of the truly evil. And we can't allow our law to become like that. When Sharia is exploited so that you tell a woman who is being violated by her father or by her stepfather, uh, oh, you can't bring four witnesses, so just go home and take it every night after night after night. This is Sharia? This is Allah's will? Seriously? I mean, uh, Allah expects us to use our intellect and to make the revelation flourish in light of our intellect. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Marwa has the next question, which is uh, directly related to what you just said. Professor. Yeah, I, tend to, I tend to get uh, emotional about these things. So if I'm going on and on and blabbing, cut me off. You know, <laughs> I, I just, I mean, when, when you've been, I, I've been in, in the human trafficking field now 20 years. And you just, you know, I, I think I will be blabbing about it on my deathbed because it's just, yeah, I don't know what to say. Go ahead, Marla, sorry. It's okay. Uh, this goes to what you were just talking about, but I just want it to be like very clear. Um, is it permissible then to invite the accused to our mosques in the absence of criminal charges or conviction? Okay. Think of the message we are sending to if if someone is accused by one person and I am by inviting this person, I am sending the message to this accused that I don't put much weight on what you said, what your accusation is. And I might be completely justified if this person has 20 years, 30 years, 40 years of Islamic service, and it is one off, one person. But the greater the number of people who testify that I then effectively am sending a message that I don't believe you or I don't value your testimony, the greater the number the, the more the, the Islamic culpability before Allah in inviting this person. So the, in, in real life, we have a fellow who has repeatedly committed sexual abuse, but actually convicted is a, some Sufi um, guy. Now, when I think of the, the bravery that the, 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 the sheer bravery that it took the woman who had everything to lose by exposing what this person did to them. And then I invite this person, what, what is the message I'm, I'm sending? I'm, I'm, I'm telling effectively, telling not the, the victims that they don't matter. And whatever happens to them Islamically, I'm responsible for that before God because I've sent that message to them. So if one of them, you know, becomes anorexic and dies, leave alone things like committing suicide, which, uh, or, or if, if, uh, if one of them completely becomes alienated from her Islam, am I going to be able to answer in the hereafter, when Allah says, why did you ignore this person? Why, why, did, why didn't you think about what is going to happen to this victim? What I want is for people to, be, to take Allah seriously, to think of what they're going to say to Allah. When you have someone who's a Quranic reciter, many women, 
have testified about sexual assaults committed to them. So am I saying that all these women are just paranoid and crazy and vindictive? What is the message that I'm sending when I say, oh, I still love his voice. Oh, mashallah, you recite Quran so beautifully. What I'm telling these women is, you don't matter. Your, 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 your pain doesn't matter to you. I, I, have, I have effectively discounted you from my ummah. Whatever I consider to my, be my relevant ummah, you are not included in that. Am I ready to answer when Allah confronts me in the year after about the consequences that these women suffered. I mean, I hear of women who are abused and as a result, when they see their abuser continue to thrive in the Muslim community, or when they see their abuser being praised by fellow Muslims, I've, I've heard of, of women who died, I've heard of women who Basically, their entire life was in, in shambles because of the, of the emotional consequences. I've heard of women who um, uh, uh, effectively lost their faith. They, they no longer connected with Allah at all. Before you invite these individuals, think about when Allah confronts you, in the hereafter, and say, how about the victims? If you say, Allah, I didn't believe the victims, and say, is it because you think that just women are liars? Is it because you think that there was a conspiracy, a conspiracy against man, this man? What is the basis for believing there was a conspiracy against this man? Is it just your bias, your bigotry, your prejudice, your... Uh, sexism, to be accountable to Allah is to always think about the way that Allah is going to confront us about our decisions in life. It is never okay. I, I can explain, and this has happened, where, where people that I knew, and it's very hard for me to believe that they've done what to tell them, you know, honestly, I don't know what to think. But when I think of when I think of what it would mean for the people who are involved for me to continue a relationship with you as if nothing happened what it would mean for these victims on i don't want to believe because i've known you for a long time i don't want to believe the accusations but i cannot bear the responsibility of the potential harm that is going to befall these victims if i continue a relationship with you and it, it, it is it, anyone that studies the the way our Prophet and the companions and Ali al-Bayt handled public responsibility, they would clearly see this element of taqwa and ittaqa in pervasive in everything. There's, you know, when they would hear rumors about a tax collector who's not, who's treating people unjustly, justice meant is that they they removed the tax collector. If they would have waited and said, no, prove the accusations against them. This is precisely how you have societies that are unhappy and societies that are full of uh, ma social maladies, social ills. Um, no, uh, to, to just the, the short answer to, to Marwa, to, to your question is, it is not all right. It is not all right to just ignore the voice of victims, especially when they're cumulative voices, and to continue inviting 
individuals who in, are in the suspect category in our spaces, especially when if doing so continues and enables them, empowers them to be in a position to continue victimizing others, especially. It's one thing if I, you know, a person like that, uh, you know, I, I, I have, him, have him over for tea in, at my home or having over for dinner, but it's quite another to continue putting this person in a position where they can um, groom another woman or another child. Because if they do it and I turn out to be wrong, I'm going to have to answer before I'm wrong. <clears throat> and that terrifies me. You know, that is the most scary thing that I can possibly think of. That it happens again and Allah says, well, you know, you, you ignore the warnings and you play the role. Uh, that's, I, I, don't, I don't know why we don't take seriously and that Allah is going to have us answer for everything, everything. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Laura, right on, on this point. Uh, Sheikh, you mentioned the notion of believing women. Can you please provide us with some references from the Quran or the Sunnah that would support the need to believe alleged victims based on their testimony alone? And this question is important because certain Muslim leaders have gone public saying that these calls to quote unquote believe women um, are not rooted in Islam and that this is merely a creation of liberalism. Um, so can you speak uh, on this point? Sani, subhanallah. Um, subhanallah, okay. So, When, and, and this is, I, I wish, I mean, the, the short answer is I wish people would follow the tafsir that we, we, we do because we go through, but let's just take some basic elements. Okay. So when the, the, the famous incident of Hadith al -Ist, with Aisha radiallahu anha, right? Aisha is accused by someone. She tells the Prophet, والسلام, it is not true. And the Prophet والسلام, doesn't know what to think. And when Allah comes and vindicates Aisha, her response to the Prophet والسلام, is, See, it is when, when her father, Abu Bakr, tells her, go up, go thank the prophet. And, and she says, why should I thank him? I thank God, because Allah vindicated me. We often take this incident and don't miss the moral lesson behind Hadith of Isf. The moral lesson is Aisha should have been believed. I mean, the, the entire revelation is shaming the community because the community didn't believe the woman. Because when she said it didn't happen, the community continued to have other opinions, other views. So the thing that, is, and this is maybe the role of, of um, misogyny in, in the interpretive enterprise and in the interpretive tradition is that an entire drama that unfolded in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come to saying, shame on you, you should have believed her. Now, of course, but not even even uh, um, when in the entire revelation of um, Surah Al Talaq, and we I go through in the tafsir in in in, in the nitty gritty details of this, 
when we Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a a series of institutions where pre-Islamic society, the husband at his say-so would um, accuse a woman of something and whatever she said would ignore. So she would be rendered a mu'allaqa. She, just by virtue of the husband's accusation alone, she would, would neither is she married to this man nor is she divorced to go and marry another. And Islam came and completely abolished the practice of simply accepting the accusation of the husband as conclusive to render a woman a model. And it's a um, uh, Mu'allaka is, is basically a, a woman who is accused uh, so because of the accusation she is no longer a she, she is no longer in a valid marriage to her husband but she's not divorced either and she remains in the and in pre-Islamic practice she would also uh, go further that she would be often under house arrest so effectively, as the husband wouldn't uh, have conjugal relations with her, but the husband would also give her only the type of support that would keep her alive, but neither divorce her. That was a very common pre-Islamic practice. And the Quran came and abolished all of that and said, either if you accuse a woman, you either bring four witnesses and if you can't bring the four witnesses, then the only al other alternative is that you swear by oath that you are truthful and may Allah curse you if you are not. But look at what the other part of it. Then the woman swears, then the test is put, it's tried by oath. Then the test is put to the woman. If she refuses to take an oath, that means then she's guilty. But if she agrees to take the oath, she swears by God that she is truthful and that may Allah curse her if she is lying, that's conclusive. It's done. Her word, then halas, it's done. If the husband is not willing to take the oath against the woman and can't produce four witnesses, her word is conclusive. So if you tell the husband, are you willing to swear that Allah, by Allah, uh, that Allah would curse you forever, that she is in fact as guilty as you say, and he says, no, I'm not willing to swear. Her word is conclusive. If I'm willing to swear and she is willing to, to rebut my swearing by then taking the oath as well, her word is conclusive. So the idea that a woman is not believed, I, I don't know where it comes from. When the Prophet ﷺ repeatedly, I would like people to show me how many times in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet is confronted by a woman who complains to him about something and the Prophet's response is, it's not true. I don't believe you. I defy you to bring me one incident. I can bring you incident after incident after incident in which women approach the prophet, complain about something, and either the prophet believes them on the spot or calls their husband or calls their uncle, depending on the case, to then question them. But not a single incident in the entire corpus of the seerah where the prophet tells a woman, woman, stop talking nonsense. So where does it come from? Yeah, I mean, it, it's mind-boggling. It really is mind-boggling. Especially, Yanni, is it if you want to get technical? 
there is an there is an opinion that fi masail sharaf but it's I, I, my, I think it's outdated to be i mean in, but anyway it's it was an opinion in islamic jurisprudence that in matters of that has to do with sexual impropriety the a woman must always be believed because it's an admission against self interest it mm -hmm. was believed that a woman has such a vested interest in her sharaf in her honor that if a woman ever says something uh, makes the type of uh, what they call admission um that in 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 american terms it would be an exception to the hearsay rules because it's an admission against the interest it's remarkable i mean personally i i think that 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 rule is outdated today but anyway but it exists in islamic jurisprudence i mean it shows you that our ancestors were using their brain and thinking about their social circumstances reading the people the the re islamic law didn't survive for a thousand over a thousand years i mean for 1200 years by ignoring the living realities of people because you can't achieve ihsan if you ignore the living realities of people so what the, the burden of proof is upon the person who makes an allegation what evidence is there that women should not be believed maybe if you and i've done this by the way in some situations where i say okay you know there's no evidence why the one way or the other so i'm going to give i'm going to do a trial by oath between the two of you when an allegation was made against someone who for appeared like they have good moral character but and there's no evidence one way or the other in under the worst of circumstances is that i say i do a trial by oath I, I present the qasam to both of them. But if the woman takes the qasam, if the victim takes the qasam, that's conclusive. Khalas. Then I, I you know, I, I tell the man, I'm sorry. I, you know, of course, I'm, this is not a court of law, but since she took the qasam, since the victim took the qasam, I have to accept it. And this raises the question. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, well, this then also raises the the question in in our context of what happens if you know, like in the case um, where there's the woman is a non-Muslim, and we have you know, what happened, for example, with with Tariq Ramadan. You know, Tariq Ramadan's situation, of course, is very uh, difficult because. I do believe that Tariq Ramadan has so many enemies uh, in the Islamophobic um, world. And I do believe that many people in French society wanted to bring him down. And I do believe that Islamophobes went out of their way to, um, to malign him, to slander him, to bring him down. But, and, especially i forgot her name the accuser that was all over tv um what you know what i've what i've heard from her children um makes me very unhappy about this woman i forgot her name the one the, the one that was appearing everywhere having said all of that this is actually a, a good example right uh Would I recommend, continue to recommend his books? Um, because someone reading his books is not going to put them in a vulnerable situation, in a potential vulnerable situation. In other words, they're just reading, yes, I do. Um, would I invite him to an event? Um, 
in other words, my Islamic obligation would I'm be willing to put a situ risk a situation where he can possibly have the type of moral spiritual authority to and uh, to convince uh, or to exercise the type of stuff that he he admitted doing. No, I wouldn't. As much as I I respect the man, and as much as I. I, I've, I've loved Tara Ramadan because I've had a long relationship with him. Um, and, it's, it's, and I believe he's a great scholar and he's a, it's a huge loss for Muslims. But there have been too many Muslim women who have complained of, what can I say, um, moral abuse. Uh, moral abuse that led to sexual, uh, you know, it, although it's supposed to be to have been consensual, I don't believe he raped anyone. I believe it was consensual. But sometimes w when it's a religious authority, the issue of consent is problematized because um, it, it, the, the function of a religious authority is that you don't don't achieve personal gains from the exercise of your position. So put it this way, a police officer, if a police officer comes and let's say flashes his badge in order to impress impressionable others, and I learned that this police officer sort of flashes his badge to get into relations with others, although they, they are consensual, but it's still an abuse of authority because you still used your authority to obtain the consent, to impress others, to induce them to give you consent. It's not rape, it's not sexual assault, but it is a misuse of influence. Mm -hmm. You are under obligation as a religious authority not to get involved. If you wanna get involved, get involved, but not with students, not with uh, potential, uh, potential members of your congregation because that has the taint of undue influence. And again, here it, it kicks off the wajib al So yeah, you wanna be, if you wanna, let's say you, if it's a particular woman, you know, because I get in this situation, well, are you saying that I can't fall in love with a member of my congregation ever? Well, you, it's, if it's a one-time exception and she fell in love with you and she, you know, it, it, she's no longer a member of your congregation, and it, it, you know it's a one-off. But if it's a pattern, if let's say you keep marrying and then divorcing members of your congregation, then no, wajib al ahliyat kicks in that I have a duty to to use precaution. And especially if women come and say, well, you know. He, the role of a religious teacher and the role of a romantic suitor were often mixed. So he was use his position as a religious teacher to get close to me, to have long conversations with me, to impress me. And uh, then there are repeated complaints. You can't just say, Oh, well, you know, as long as there's consent, then halas, we're fine. It, and especially the, the more susceptible, you know, it's one thing if, if, if this person gets involved with an equal, a scholar gets involved with a scholar, uh, you know, a, a sheikh gets involved with a sheikh. I'm not too worried about that, but I am worried. If a sheikh gets involved with some young person 
who is often confused by the desire to come closer to God and that Sheikh is perceived as a bridge to God. Mm -hmm. And then she starts imagining that this Sheikh can bring me closer to God and the path to get closer to God doesn't go through your body. I don't know why the sheikh needs to have a relationship physically with you to bring you closer to God. And that's where it, 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 we have to be, we have to demand standards of moral conduct from our, in the same that way that we demand intellectual standards, which we are horrible about because we, we make no intellectual demands. We don't even require them to be well-read or well-educated or, or even have a clue in, about anything. But similarly about moral conduct, it, it, you, because the responsibility we bear is is truly a heavy one. It's a responsibility for Islam. I mean, we are the in, we are the representatives of Islam in whatever we do, and so uh, it, my Lord, I mean, if if the Prophet ﷺ says that a word a word can potentially be the reason that you end up in hellfire. How about, not a word, how about the destruction of a human soul? I mean, how about a, a one person who because of you um, loses faith in everything? You know, sometimes we can't, you can't help it. There are people who just, you know, I, I, I'm sure there are people out there who are very disappointed in me and think I'm, you know, but, but at least have you done what you can? Do you have a clean conscience? Um, and I think we are not, I mean, we, subhanAllah, we are not honest about, about what, What the, we still have the, let me, sorry, we still have this part of us that, let's be very honest about it, that when a woman surrenders herself to a man, we still have that part of us that we blame the woman. Well, it's, it is as if the, 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 the unspoken assumption is, well, if she was really clean, if she was really a good person, she wouldn't have. And my my position about this, shame on you. I mean, show me evidence that Allah dis discriminates between women and men on the question of honor, sexual honor. Um, show me evidence in the entire Islamic tradition that um, says because of any decision a woman makes that somehow her value becomes lesser than the value of the man. What is the evidence for that? But that is the assumption I often feel that, well, and especially, by the way, in secret marriages and stuff like that. Well, you know, she agreed to a secret marriage. It's like, well, you know, she's, it's like she's not clean. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's like she's not clean because, well, she gave, she, she gave herself to, to this man. And the poor man, what, what, he, what is he going to do? You know, the woman surrendered herself to him. I think that type of thinking 
destroys our religion. Because these are the women who are the wives, the mothers, they are truly the backbone of society. And if your women feel that society is full of contradictions and hypocrisies and double standards, and they are themselves are not anchored in being proud about their faith, about, about their Iman, about their Aqidah, about their tarikh, about their, their history. It, it, the cumulative effect on us as a society is, is devastating, is absolutely devastating. And the, I, I, I just, you know, the reason I, I, I even Grace doesn't know this. Um, I used to, in teaching uh, asylum and refugee law, when I'm uh, lecturing to students, and the, the cases we have a sexual assault, uh, or we have FGM, female genital mutilations, I would sweat and blush and just be an, an absolute embarrassment when I'm trying to deal with the the fact patterns of the fact details of female genital mutilations or a sexual assault in an asylum case. I entered the field of human trafficking because I said, I still have that cultural part of me, of me that I, I, I get traumatized by the idea of, I, I'm just talking about sexual topics. Just, And what I learned from human trafficking is that is that a society that doesn't speak honestly about the most intimate and sensitive issues allows these issues to become the den of demons. That's where that's where demons grow. And when we have this unspoken assumption. We, we all know that a lot of imams engage in, in secret marriages. And we have a very dismissive attitude towards a woman who agrees to something like that, often ignoring, well, the, the social dynamics that, that allows this, this type of abuse to exist and the theology that allows for this type of abuse to exist. Uh, I think that's, that, that's extremely devastating upon our societies. Okay, thank you so much. I think, uh, well, we, we have a lot of questions that relate to everything that you've touched upon, but let's go back. Laura had a follow-up question, so let's start there. Just to answer your question, Sheikh, and I don't know if it was rhetorical, um, I think it, some of it at least might come from a misunderstanding of the uh, rule on women giving testimony and, and the value of a testimony of a woman. I think some of it might come from, from there. Um, and uh, the accuser of Tariq Ramadan was Hinda Ayari. Um, and so just switching gears, um, this question goes to what the Muslim leader who has been accused of sexual or spiritual abuse owes the public. Um, and in this case, we can assume that the, the leader has been accused but has not been found um, guilty by a court of law. So what do they owe the victims? Do they owe them a response, a public apology, resignation from their position of power and retreat from the public space? monetary damages, something else. Um, this question goes to the response of a Quran reciter who was uh, accused of serious wrongdoings. And his response was that he would not uh, address the allegations made against, against him until formal complaints with law enforcement would be made. Um, other leaders accused of abuse um, also continue to teach their audiences, and um, some have addressed the situation publicly, others have not. So 
So what do these Muslim leaders owe the accused? What do they owe the public? Um, you know, um, there, there, there is a, subhanAllah, there, there's a, a, a qaida or a, a, a maxim which says that uh, that you, you can't imply a statement to someone who's silent. But on the other hand, there's another maxim that says if the circumstances create an obligation to speak, the failure of to speak is a moral wrong. And this is one of the, these um, uh, situations. Um, what the old republic is a formal, if you have accusations, then you either you are you have an obligation to address these accusations to a full vetting of the accusations if you are saying these people are biased against you explain why you believe that they are biased against you if there are grounds to believe it if you are saying these people have whatever it is if I mean, and this is assuming that someone is denying guilt. Um, admission of guilt um, could, the rights of a human being must be restored to the human being. You cannot God, you cannot assume God's forgiveness of the of the rights of a victim because hukuk al ibad accrues to the ibad, the, the, the rights of people accrue to the, to the people that own this right. In Sharia, you, you cannot assume that God will forgive the right of a human being. God can forgive God's right, but the right of the human being, the assumption, that the working assumption is that the right of a human being will not be forgiven by God unless the human being forgives that right. So in other words, forgiveness of the right of a human being is contingent on forgiveness by the human being because the human being is the possessor of the right. And that's an assumption, meaning that while God has the power to forgive anything, God is the ultimate authority, you are not allowed to have that type of presumption that God in fact will forgive unless the human being involved themselves, um, you know, either demands exaction or, or forgives, or they are the possessor of rights. So if I want forgiveness, I must address, I'm, th that is between me and the victims, meaning whether the victims want an apology, the victims want compensation, the victims want, um, whatever. Uh, I would hope that the public would response to abuse is to not welcome this individual in their public space until, uh, uh, you know, as uh, if they repent and and, and their, their sira changes. So if they re-emerge as a repentant person, it's possible. But as to the imam or the, the person in the, involved, you know, um, 
if they want Allah's forgiveness, they better deal directly with the victims. Because to assume that Allah will forgive without in fact making sure that the victims themselves are satisfied is very dangerous. But beyond that, at a minimum, if a person knows they're guilty, is withdrawal and contrition. I mean, tawbah is, is, tawbah is not possible without admission of guilt first. You, you, there's no tawbah. If you, the idea that a tubah is done, but I don't admit it, is, is, a, is an oxymoron. It's, it's, it's contradiction. Uh, to, in, in order for you to repent, you must acknowledge your guilt first. Um, now, acknowledging the guilt and Tauba requires, at a minimum, a withdrawal and, and, and a period of, of purification and reflection. I mean, I, I've, uh, I don't know if I'm uh, it, it, in the commission, a sheikh committing a sexual misconduct. It, it, for me, it is very hard to re-accept or ex accept the public role by that individual again. Um, uh, it is just your, and of course, it, it, let me qualify that by saying it depends on the sexual misconduct involved. Um, but but this is the same. For instance, if I learn that a sheikh physically abuses um, his wife, for instance, that's a disqualifier for me. Uh, a sheikh who's constantly beating his wife. I actually knew someone like that. I don't want to say where, but um, a person very popular in the circuits and and so on. But the fact that it it shows me a lack of taqwa, a, a lack of regard for the rights of the other. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, the community that the sheikh came from ignored the woman's Yeah, I mean, and, and even ostracized her when she went to court um, until she withdrew her all her accusations and the, the guy is still in circulation. But that's exactly the type of wrong that, that I find very problematic. Now, when it's sexual, it's even worse because sexual abuse is an indication of, of uh, uh, fusuk. Uh, what I expect from someone that takes the position of the spokesman for God in the same way that I have very demanding expectations of them intellectually, what they must be able to read, what they must be able to master. But I also have very demanding expectations of them morally. Because put it this way, if you have a child, would you trust the child with this individual? You have to be very honest with yourself. And if the answer is no, then this individual has, should not, has no business being in a public role. You must be very honest with yourself. It, you can't, it can't be that, well, I don't trust this person with my child, but I'll set this person loose on the children of others. Can you imagine a bigger haram than that? Um, if you can't control your sexual desire, then, then don't play a role as a religious leader. I mean, go be whatever you want to be. I mean, it, you, you don't have, it, it, at least if you, whatever sins you commit, if they're, if they're committed as a, as a private individual, um, you're not damaging the entire community. By the way, this is also a part of, of, the, of how poorly we, we train 
are religious. I mean, you, you go to Medina for a couple of years and now you're a chaplain or an imam or whatever. Um, to, to, to train to control who you are, to be a master, uh, the master of yourself, um, is, is the least one can do if, they, if they're going to be the carrier of Sharia. Thank you. I feel like I should also ask, um, you know, there, there must be, I'm sure, more rare uh, situations where um, the accused are, are wrongly accused and that um, it's not, it, you know, there are cases obviously where, where people make accusations for whatever reason and the accused are in fact innocent. It is. I mean, but because I in 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 the field of law, I I've seen cases where, um, but they're usually an isolated event incident, and usually um, there will be telltale signs like the, for instance, the accuser has an unnatural obsession with the individual involved. Um, they're stalking them. Uh, so I have had cases like that where the, the woman is stalking the guy and and uh, as part of that conduct, there are a lot of accusations that she that woman is making. But the 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 the, the fact that there is one off, the fact that there's signs of obsession, the fact that there's signs of neurosis. Um, are all indicative of this person's innocence. The other thing is that, again, one-off was a financial interest. So, you know, you get someone who makes an accusation, but they're making it in the context of filing a lawsuit. Um, and you look up the reputation of the lawyers involved and their ambulance chasers, the, you know, hyenas. Uh, there's the types of uh, lawyers that file lawsuits uh, to obtain settlements. And then that to me is clear and, okay, well, you know, I, I don't put too much weight on the fact that it, it is the lawyers who do the filings, it's the lawyers who do the drafting, it's the lawyers who do the, the all the talking, and uh, it is the lawyers who then want to obtain the settlement, especially in American courts where contingency fee arrangements is is um, is very common. So you have lawyers that you know work on contingency fee basis, and they they are like sharks. They're just and it, you know, but these are is different from when you have a, an imam or a teacher where there are repeated scenarios, accusations of a, a pattern of conduct involving a number of people. And there is no evidence of neurosis or neurotic behavior and no evidence of financial gain either. Um, and in fact, the person making the accusations is, is often acting against self-interest meaning that making the accusations cause a great deal of damage to the accuser. Mm -hmm. When I see a situation like this, then my, my sense of, I have an Islamic obligation towards ikhtiyat, towards precaution, is triggered. Meaning I must be very careful because if I'm not careful and damage, the res resulting damage to X, Y, or Z, then I become accountable and responsible for this damage. And it is my obligation to act, you know, in, 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 to use a, to, to be, to exercise reasonable care. What is reasonable is, is something that it's the essence of what Allah tells us is fitness. I mean, I have an article about reasonability in Sharia, where I, I trace the, 
the, the, the various situations where Sharia actually invokes the concept of uh, what is reasonable. And what is reasonable is, is, is determined, is learned through what is ma'ruf, what is, what is the, the common practices of human beings, of ethical human beings. And it is the balance of rights between people. But we have, you know, uh, uh, Laura, uh, or Laura, sorry, uh, was saying that maybe the, the law of evidence and women, um, where, I mean, the fact that Allah says in the Quran that. In in cases of witnessing a contract, that a man or or two women, and then explains this by saying that perhaps if a woman forgets, then the other will remind her. It doesn't sound to me at all like saying that women lack credibility. It sounds to me like in the context of business practices is saying that women in that particularly at that time lack experience but where i i often defy people to show me any evidence any precedent in which a woman they were used to have the pakistani rape laws which said that a woman who uh, complaints of rape has to produce four witnesses. And there have been tons of a, a huge body of literature by scholars from all over the Muslim world who have shown time and again that these Pakistani rape laws that required that a woman who is sexually assaulted to produce four witnesses is completely insane that sexual assault falls under the law of Hiraba, not the laws of Zina. And that the laws of Hiraba, you can prove a case of Hiraba either through two witnesses or circumstantial evidence. And that a Muharrim is treated very differently than a Zani because you, because it, the law of Haraba, or you know, you can translate it as brigandage, as bandits, as literally, Haraba is someone who assaults another by exercising power over them at, where they are powerless to defend. So the idea that I have gone on an extensive research to find examples of what today in our world we would call sexual molestation. And I've compiled fatawa from various periods of Islamic history in which a a, merchant, a, a woman who has accused a merchant uh, of having inappropriately touched her, is ordered by the muhtasib to be flopped. I mean, we're talking about medieval law, right? And where a, a Maliki Mufti, or it's often Malikis or Hanafis, they say that, uh, that the, the oath would be directed to the man, the oath would be directed to the woman, and but they would say if the woman takes the oath, she is to be believed because it's an admission against self-interest that the woman, they the, the presumption was that the woman would not normally say I have been touched because it, it is shameful, embarrassing there, especially in these societies. Um, and so then, then the the qadi would or the qadi would request a fatwa from a mufti. The mufti would issue a fatwa saying that the, the person should be uh, caned or whipped or whatever, and that then, in fact, they, that, that punishment would, would have been carried out. I have compiled fatwa where 
you don't have a caning, but you have a fining by interestingly fining went to the treasury, not to the victim uh, in, in a number of these cases. I have cases where uh, people who are conducting business are banished. They're told to leave the marketplace because they were, they were accused of having inappropriately touched women. This even became a political issue in the period of the Mongols in Halab in Aleppo and Damascus, because the Mongol soldiers were apparently often sexually harassed women. And if a mufti issued a fatwa against them that they'd be punished, the mufti's life would be in danger. But what is amazing is the bravery of Muslim scholars in still saying that the, the woman ought to be believed. I have fatawa from Mamluki Egypt, when again, scholars and they twist to themselves would say, because Mamluki soldiers are so morally corrupt, their pattern and practice of behavior, it makes it True. very likely that in fact, accusations of molestation are credible that you don't even need an oath for the woman to be believed. How could our tradition be full of these fatawa from various periods of Islamic history? In fact, sometimes in these fatawa, I feel to myself, you know, is it, because often the assumption is that it's an admission against self-interest because women wouldn't embarrass themselves like that. And I would ask myself, you know, at what point does that assumption not work anymore? But you have that in our tradition, and then you have these modern Muslims who somehow think it's the Islamic thing not to believe women. <laughs> I, I want to, you know, may Allah give me the, 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 the health and, and energy to, to publish this because it, it, it needs to be out. But it's, it's shameful, it's embarrassing that I actually need to publish this to convince people of what I think is rather obvious. Uh, you know, if I... Would... A sexual, a sexual, yeah, I understand that if you have a financial incentive, you might lie. Yeah, I, I understand if you are a psychotic person who tends to have a, gets to get, you know, fixated upon individuals and become an obsessed stalker, then, but that's not, these are the exceptions. Um, To, to make an, to, 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 to say I have been sexually targeted, it's a very embarrassing situation to be in. I mean, a, a victim puts so much of themselves out there when they make something like that. Um, I, I just don't, I, I just, I, for the life of me, I don't understand where that notion that we just ignore the, um, how many of our shiuk and our history, the, 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 the ones that, that you have been, the, the ones who are normally accused of sexual misconduct tend to become negated in history. In other words, you, you, it, they're the ones that are dropped from the annals of jurisprudence. Uh, how did we end up in the modern age the way we are? I mean, and it, we started out with pornography. Is it, is it that, you know, you, you start thinking, well, is it, is it pornography's fault? Is it the fault of weak, weak social fabric? 
Is it the fault of um, our sense of morality and ethics and Islam has become more of a ritualistic practice that has far more to do with identity than actual morality? Um, anyway, I'm talking too much, I'm sorry. Uh, let's just, thank you very much. It. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, let's move on. Actually, um, I'm, I'm, Amira has the next question. Thank you. So there's been some recent examples where Muslim leaders were accused of, you know, sexual harassing or behaving in a predatory manner towards women in their communities or their congregations, and they defended themselves by saying that, you know, they were misunderstood and they were acting with the intention of marriage. So my question is, if we have any examples in the tradition for how a single male Muslim leader should navigate finding a wife, um, and in a way that takes into consideration the power dynamics that come with their position. Yeah. Um, you know, um, subhanAllah, um, What is the, the the ethics of the, what is the, what we learn in, in the, the ethics of Muslim marriage is directness, transparency. So we are not we are even ordered not to confuse things by half competing khutbahs. The whole idea of a waiting period is to clear, to, and the idea that in a waiting period you don't have no marriage aspirations, is to draw the clear lines at the end of a, one relationship, and then you start thinking of it of another relationship. That if a person has an interest, then that that they make their their intentions or their, their interests very clear that if there is a period of the courting, it's known as a khutbah, and that when there is a khutbah, that even you cannot entertain two khutbahs at the same time. This is, we are taught from the Prophet that you can't do that. You can't have two or three or four women simultaneously uh, I mean, it's very interesting because although you're allowed to marry, I mean, in traditional jurisprudence, you're allowed to marry more than one wife. The, the, the most scholars said that you can't have, you can't have the confusion of several khutbahs out there at the same time. Uh, which I mean, it's a, it's an, it's an, it's an it's scholarly, it's a matter of scholarly interest where. Um, um, you know, if you get done with one marriage before you move to another in cases of polygamy. Anyway, but this is all anchored in what? Anchored in the idea of sub, and that when truthfulness in relationships, because the lack of truth in relationships is a um, is a doorway to shaitan. Now, I'll tell you, one of the, 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 the biggest failures in the modern age, and it, there has always been this juristic debate whether you can have an intent other than what you, so if I'm marrying a woman and my intent is to divorce this woman after a month, but I fail to inform her, does that, so in other words, my intent is not in a permanent marriage, but a, a, a timed marriage. I'm going to divorce her after a month, but I don't inform her and I don't put it in the contract. Is the marriage contract still valid or not? And this was a matter of disagreement among pre-modern jurists 
I was the view that it, it, this makes the marriage contract a fascist contract. But like a lot of things in medieval jurisprudence, there's disagreement. But what the problem is, is that modern scholars, especially it started in, in the Gulf, which they call Zawaj al Misyar, jumped on what was a minor, a minor Hanbali point of view that as long as the marriage contract doesn't say anything about being temporary, that your matupten, the intent that you have, you hold inside, doesn't have to be consistent with what you inform your spouse. In other words, in, in, in the Wajal Messiah, you could lie, to put it bluntly. And these jurists, for reasons that I think we all understand, they were all in Saudi Arabia, said that this Dawaj is halal, that it is okay for these people who go to, let's say a village in Egypt, a village in Morocco, they go to a poor family, say, I want to marry your daughter. Their intent is to divorce the daughter after a month, two months, three months. But the marriage contract says it's a regular marriage. And whether the parents know or not, it's immaterial. Because what these fatawa said is that it is halal for your intent to be different than what you dispose. What they made halal by doing that is lying, is lying. So the ripple effect from that is that our people, our imams that go study in, you know, for two years in Mecca or two years in Medina or whatever, but even what is remarkable, even where in places that are Sufi imams, not Wahhabi imams, but Sufi imams, that view became spread in the Muslim world like wildfire. The idea that you as a man can have an ulterior, different, intent than the one you disclose to your spouse. Lying. Let's call it what it is. It's lying. Well, no, I didn't lie to her. I just didn't tell her. I didn't disclose it. Sorry. That's exactly what fraud is. You, you've tricked a person into engaging in a situation other than, why am I saying this? Why am I saying this? It's because it affected the ethical attitudes of, now interestingly, because I've had debated this ad nauseum with so many of them. What if the woman had a different intent? Now you said it's halal for the man to have an intent to marry the woman and then divorce her, although not, but, but what if the woman had the intent? And they say, no, that's haram. Okay, ha oh, really? So why is it haram for the woman, halal for the man? Oh, it's haram for the woman to, to enter if she you know, plans to play with the guy and then leave him after three months. No, she can't do that. That's haram. What basis? Show me any evidence from the Quran and Sunnah that, that Allah says these double standards are okay. But why am I saying that? Because it colored the attitude. I've noticed this... this um, while I grew up accustomed to shiur, that it's a point of honor for them to be as straight as an arrow. Yani, if they, as much as, if they want to, to, to sit with a woman, they'll, 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 you know, go get the permission of her father, go get the permission of her brothers, go get the permission of her mother, go get the, and, you know, and be straight as an arrow. I'm sitting with you because I am interested in, in, in marriage. And if, if they decide against it, they apologize to the family, they get a gift to the family and say, I'm sorry. It just, like, that's what I'm accustomed to. I've noticed this new unethical um, norms pervade 
so much of the Muslim community that it became fair game to um, explore and play the field, if you will. Um, well, it, it's fair game if I spend some time with a woman, uh, not really disclose everything, because honesty doesn't affect the validity of the marriage contract. Some of them even point to riwayat that Islamophobes love to use, in which supposedly the you know the the, story, the famous story about Zaid, the, the the prophet's adopted so-called adopted son. Um, oh well, you know if the prophet saw a woman and thought she was so beautiful and immediately wanted to marry her then it must be that it's okay if I'm overtaken by a woman's beauty. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good. That type of morality is devastating. So my answer, A, a lot of these situations involve sitting with a woman in private, one-on-one. -on -one. Why are you sitting with a woman in private? I'm maybe old fashioned, but why are you, the only time is either you have a compelling religious reason, like you're talking about counseling a woman about very, very private matter that you can't, uh, or you have a clear interest in marrying her, but then the interest has to be very clear under the circumstances, very clear, but just especially for a sheikh to just have a, oh, she's a friend. We're flirting with each other. A sheikh that flirts? I mean, what type of sheikh? That's why I don't like shiuch, the, the hip shiuch of today. To me, I, I think I've said it before, a sheikh should not be hip should not be, you know, muscular and wearing jeans and wear a t-shirt and be, you know, have nice hair. No, a sheikh is, 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 is supposed to represent an institution. And that institution doesn't include being sexy. Um, so there you go. Thank you so much. Um... I'm going to actually uh, ask, I'm going to switch the order of some of the questions. Um, are, are you there, Sarah? Let me just see. So we, we had an order, but we we're also following the flow of what you're talking about. So I don't know if, if Sarah was ready. If not, I'm going to actually ask Reem. Oh, should I go ahead or? Oh, sorry, you're there. Sorry, I didn't see you. Okay, yes. Sarah, go ahead, please. So I do feel like a lot of portions of this question were answered, but just kind of, I guess, to... To, get, to focus the answer is, um, what are the Islamic re legal requirements for the validity of a marriage on the topic of secret marriages? Um, yeah. Are they even halal? And if not, where does this idea that they're halal come from? You know, uh, okay. This is a subtle point. This is, this is a, if the, those of you who are lawyers will, will get it right away. But if you're not a lawyer, let me just, explain this distinction and there is Islamic jurisprudence often when we talk about law we are thinking of the consequences of disobeying the law so often Muslim jurists when they talked about the validity of the contract they were talking about what is sufficient to make a conjugal relation legally valid in the sense that it that there is no criminal penalty that can be applied because two people are living together and the answer to that that they often gave is offer and acceptance a mahar, dowry, and most schools said two witnesses. That is, if you can 
testify that there was an offer and acceptance and a mahar and two witnesses, that is enough to protect you from legal prosecution for a conjugal relation. The part that is often exploited is the issue of ishar. Ishar means to make public, to, to announce to the masses. We know that the Prophet ﷺ would make it a point when people would marry that to hold a celebration, a walima, and in other words, an event in which the Prophet ﷺ would invite people and people would receive notice that these two now are married. But when Muslim jurists were talking about the, the minimum requirements for a marriage, most of them said a walima, a, 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 a public event, a, and public announcement is recommended but not mandatory for a validity of a marriage. And remember, when they meant what they when they talked about a validity of a marriage, it meant for the purposes of protecting you from criminal prosecution and for the purposes of invoking inheritance laws. So as long as you can bring two witnesses that say we in fact testify that this we, we saw these two people have a valid contract clause. But the minority view that said ishar, it's a minority view, but that said that ishar, meaning publicity, is a is not illegal, it's not a legal um, uh, condition, but a, a, a religious version. In other words, that if you yasam in that you incur a sin if you fail to do it, but it doesn't invalidate your marriage. So that view said that if you fail to make your marriage public, then that's an if, that's a sin. But it doesn't mean that the marriage is invalid. And I completely understand what the, what the view, where that view came from, is that what it's saying is, is that we can't, you know, it, it, people have various circumstances why, in, in especially in the pre-modern ages where there are no registries, you know, um, often, um, uh, uh, people have marriage contracts that are stamped by two witnesses and uh, they are moving from, you know, without visas, without borders from one Islamic city to another Islamic city where, you know, the, the contract must protect them from prosecution. Otherwise, we can have all types of prosecutions of strangers. In other words, where basically strangers become the ones who are constantly targeted by prosecutions. So I understand where that, that view completely, basically saying that if you make it a point to make your marriage secret, then that's an issue, that's haram, but it doesn't affect the validity of your marriage. Now, a lot of imams that get involved in is that they look up in the fiqh books and they see that oh, a marriage requires offer consent to witnesses. Interestingly, many of them completely ignore the fact that uh, that you can't, the, the husband can't keep the copy of the marriage contract and refuse to give, give it to the wife, that the husband can't keep the information about the witnesses and refuse to give it to the wife. That part that is often ignored. But many of them then say, well, you know, I don't see Ishar as a condition. Then, and that's what they tell women. 
in many situations, I've seen that they show the woman in the book that all it says is offer acceptance and two witnesses. And some, and even, and, and I think we have to, again, kitab and hikmah. What is the problem with secret marriages? Is that they, they often victimize an inexperienced woman. It is, and often a woman, after the marriage dissolves, the woman finds that she it is can't say is not in a position to say I I was married and divorced, so they're hi she's hiding the marriage from her family, maybe even from society, that she's not a virgin anymore, that it. It, ha it, deeps, it leaves deep emotional scars on her that she was married for a while and dumped. And the hurt and the bitterness, and again, justice, justice and hukuk and rights are contingent on one another. In other words, you can't have justice unless you address the hukuk. Hukukullah and hukuk al the rights of God and the rights of people. You can't say there is sharia, but I don't address the rights. If you have proper training in sharia, you, the, the ABCs of it is sharia is contingent on hukukullah and hukuk al the rights of people and the rights of God. The, the process of addressing Sharia is to demonstrate that you are fulfilling rights. So, if you understand that methodological point, in what way are the hukuk of the women in this situation addressed? Why am I saying this? Because it leads me to the conclusion that in our circumstances today, Perhaps ishar should be a requirement of a marriage contract because it is, I am not, you know, um, I, I've seen it in, in many, you know, I've, I've had situations where, you know, a woman, um, I, she, she wants to marry an Ahmadi guy. You know, they're both adults. And she said that, you know, if my family knew that I married an Ahmadi, they would kill me. Um, I, so I engage in the secret marriage uh, with this guy. You know, they're both adults, they're both the same age. What I told her is, you know, living dishonestly is not healthy to your iman. But I'm, I, I, you know, my understanding of Pakuk is, she wanted it as much as, and it wasn't a temporary marriage, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, it, but when I see, you know, a woman who's never been, not previously married, with some hotshot imam guy, and, oh, I'm engaging in a secret marriage, why is it secret? Well, he's, he's already married. Well, you know, he can't be associated with me, and, uh, well, this, this imam has a whole line of secret marriages. How can we tell Allah that this, this satisfies the hukuk of people? Sharia is hukuk. So how hukuk rights? How can we tell Allah that the rights are satisfied? When I have, when this leaves deeply scarred women who feel like they've been used and tossed aside. As an ummah, as if you are considered a representative of Sharia, can you truly, and with an honest face, tell me that, well, that's God's law and it's not your problem, that the, the pain of these women is just not your problem because this is what God wants? You know, it, we sometimes over-intellectualize things, taking things to the, to the basic ABCs of what our religion is about, what Sharia is about, provides us with a great deal of clarity. But this is where it all comes from. This is where it all comes from. I mean, it, it is, um, 
yeah, you know, technically they're right. Yeah, the, the, the two witnesses, but but morally they're they're not right. Uh, as a matter of 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 your relationship with Allah, they're not right. Um, you know, I I have to in in the spirit of disclosure. I don't know if I said this before, but you know, I, there was a son of a very famous um, sheikh uh, in the U.S. Not sheikh, but Muslim leader, very well known. You know, he married this woman, and then uh, because his parents wouldn't be wouldn't ever uh, approve, and then when they discovered that he was married to her secretly. He dumped her um, and left her was, uh, they, they had bought on uh, this credit card, all this furniture, they bought a car, they bought, you know, a lot of stuff jointly. And then when he dumped her, he refused to pay um, any part of that credit card bill. And I sued him, you know, um, Islamically, I felt. I, it is my obligation to help this woman by suing him. And Islamically, the fact that he is the son of a very well-known Islamic figure and that in turn, he became a very well-known Islamic figure, just gave, gave me the added impetus to, to represent her pro, pro bono. Um, because it's just, I, I can't allow this to be Allah Sharia. I can't allow this, this affair. I have an obligation to protect Allah Sharia. And that's what I told the father. That's what I told him. Um, you know, when they were saying, you know, brother, why are you doing this? You know, going to the kuffar or to so, you, know, you are the ones that if you paid your your debt if you were straightforward if you were islamic uh, but don't use going to the kuffar to commit injustice and say you should just have to take it quietly um, that, um yeah so anyway that's a response to the whole thing, the whole the whole deal about the, the validity of Islamic contract. I also I just I know you you talked about um, uh, secret marriage, but do you want to say anything additional about the idea of temporary marriages? Yeah, I mean, of course, temporary marriage. The the, the there's the there's a juristic. It's a long juristic issue, whether it was, and that, you know, what you, you often learn that it is it, allowed in Shia jurisprudence, it's not allowed in Sunni jurisprudence. Um, things are not that simple. It, there are long debates in Shia jurisprudence as to, when is it permissible to engage in a temporary marriage or not permissible? But what I can tell you about all the Shia jurisprudence that I've read um, is that it is always premised on the idea of full consent by people who engage in it for their mutual advantage. Now on the Sunni side, the idea the Sunnis say, well, the Shiites uh, allow temporary marriage, but we don't, which is not true because they they allow jawaz and nisyar, which is worse than temporary marriage. At least temporary marriage, you have to be honest about your intentions and you have to put in the contract when the be marriage begins and when the marriage ends. Jawaz and nisyar is fraudulent. You, you you have an intention. To terminate the marriage on, on, a, on a certain time, on a, uh, you know, to, to terminate this marriage after a certain term, but you never disclose it. You never put it in the contract, and you don't actually disclose it to the other side. Um, 
Can you define what that about? Arabic term was? I didn't catch. The, Which? The, the, the uh, Yeah, yeah. The, the Sunni version that you said is worse than... than which basically means uh, pleasure marriage. Okay. It's sort of, um, I said, you know, pleasure marriage, which is worse because you, you enter it, but you don't put it in the contract that is temporary and you don't even have to tell the other person that it's temporary. Um, listen, I, you know, I'm not dogmatic about this. Um, there are... Uh, if two mature adults enter into a temporary marriage um, because they weren't sure, I mean, in, under certain circumstance, like uh, they were in, in a war in Bosnia and they, they uh, these are not the situations I'm concerned about. To, to be very clear, if, if I can see evidence of actual full voluntary consent, just because you call, you call it temporary, it doesn't. What I'm concerned about is fraudulent marriages, is exploitative marriages, is marriages that evidence someone is victimizing someone else. So when rich executives, and which is, happens in Egypt all the time, rich executives go and find poor employees who can hardly make a living. And they say, okay, I'm gonna marry you, but you have, and they put it under contract. Uh, this, you know, I, and they, they have an intention to marry this person for three months uh, or six months. And they have no rights at all beyond what the, the dowry that they received. It's prostitution. It's someone who's powerful exploiting someone who's not powerful for a sum of money so they can use them sexually for a period of time. When I hear of temporary marriages entered in, in by wealthy shiuch or wealthy ayatollahs in Iran or Iraq, with poor disempowered women, that's prostitution. Get to the substance of things. We, we have to be honest. And, and in, when it's abusive, it's abusive. When it, it is a person exploiting and consuming another person, it's harm. I am not at all moved to say anything when I see you know, two equally powerful adults enter into a relationship and they call it a temporary marriage. I say, Allahu Alam, you know, uh, that's your business, khalas. But when it is someone exploiting someone else, that's very problematic. And, and, and that's where, where I, think, I think, I really believe that Allah looks to the truth of things. Not the labels of things. Is there a human being? If, because in the same way, you, you and I can have a completely valid legal marriage. But if I abuse you in this valid, valid marriage, is Allah going to look at this and say, well, it's okay, you can abuse her because this marriage is, is by label, technically correct. No. Allah looks to the substance of things. What actually are the, the truths of the dynamics between human beings? And so, um, you know. So by the same token, if you are engaging your two mutually equally powerful adults engaging in a temporary marriage, but it's really just for pleasure, is that? You know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to say about anything about that. If Allah knows, if Allah knows that for whatever circumstances that they are, um, there's no fraud, there's no deception, there's no, no one taking advantage of the other, I leave that to Allah. I wouldn't engage in it, but I leave it up to Allah. I am not going to... Um, 
uh, what what my vigilance, my my what what gets me animated is when exploitation and abuse. I I am not. I, I am I do not covet the role of a moral judge. Uh, and often I will go out of my way to avoid moral judgment on people whose intentions Allah knows best when there is no complaint of exploitation and harm. Okay. I'm doing that. Okay. Um <laughs> You know, two hours always passes by way too fast. We've gone past the two hour mark. Um, over, I'm, we're at 623. Um, we still have a few really great questions. So I hope it's Go okay. It. We can keep yeah, going. Go okay. So um, I'd like to have Reem ask the next question. Thanks, Grace. Um, so going, so we're, we've talked about allegations um, and the process around that. I would like to have a little bit more insight on the context involving investigations. Um, what Islamic evidentiary principles should be applied when there is an actual investigation ongoing? It's inevitable that someone will always bring up the four witness rule, which you've mentioned. I would also like a little bit of clarification on the four witness rule in context of the investigation as far as like what is the purpose of it and the correct application of it um, and is it even something that we can even practically use considering the society that we live in today? Okay, that, that's a good question. Just one, one second, give me one second. I, I had to feed my, my coke addiction, sorry. Um, I don't wanna advertise for the company, so my soda addiction. Um, the, the four witness rule was de decreed defensively I mean, there, it was decreed in two situations, right? Situations where a husband accuses a wife um, and especially in this pre-Islamic practice where husbands would level accusations against their wives often to because they 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 would they it had, it normally they, it had monetary um, motivations. The the wife would have money, the husband would want to take this money, but doesn't want her doesn't want her to marry someone else, so she can't take her money away. So he makes an accusation. So the Quran came and said, "Well, you either could use four witnesses or you engage in." this uh, trial by oath. And importantly, it was decreed. Uh, did I hear something? Oh. No, it was decreed to protect women, to protect the wife. In, in other words, the, the context of the law is to protect the accused, not to empower the accuser. Okay. And the accused here, was, was the wife, a woman. The second context was in the in famous hadith. In, in, the, in uh, if you turn off your mic, if you're speaking, because I hear it. Yeah. Okay, the second context in the famous hadith of if, where if you are accusing a woman of zina, you either bring four witnesses, but if one of the witnesses recants, then you are in turn punished for slander. Again, the context was to protect women 
from the accusation of unfounded accusation of zina. Now, the the context was four witnesses in, but if there are in fact four witnesses that witness, it's very specific act because it is not sufficient that the witness two naked people in bed, for instance, they actually must witness the actual act of intercourse. Then there is a very severe criminal punishment that results from that. The fact that you have this procedure, not four witnesses that must witness the actual act of intercourse, the result is a very severe criminal punishment, doesn't mean that then that procedure is an umbrella that covers all other acts in which the rights of people are violated. Because, and this is, by the way, the, the, the grandfather of Ibn Rushd, Ibn Rushd the grandfather, the Maliki jurist, not the uh, philosopher, has a very famous fatwa about this, in which a there was a sexual assault, and again, some of yes, uh, some of the um, pig-headed people said, "Oh well, you you know you need four witnesses to, to prove the sexual assault." And he, in his fatwa, he, he says, that "You can't take a procedure that was designed to protect a a victim against slander and apply it." to punish victims who are targeted by violent crime. Look at, that's, that's using a hikma. You see, a, a, a rational person thinking, saying you can't just graft this on this. It doesn't follow. You must look at the, what, the intention behind the law and the context of the law and the system for it. So, no. You, you, the, the four witnesses rule only applies if we are talking about implementing the criminal penalty for zina, which we, we, we are not implementing in the society. Now, in every other situation, we have to rely on circumstantial evidence and proper probes of investigation. If you are conducting an actual investigation, you can't simply listen to one side without hearing the other. Because you are in a voluntary system, in other words, we, we don't have jurisdiction of compulsion, both the accuser and accused must accept the judgment of the trier of fact. In other words, the accuser and accused must say, yes, both of us accept that this person is a proper investigator and a valid judge. If the accuser or accused say, no, we don't accept their judgment, then, then you can't claim that this is a legitimate investigation. But assuming that the accuser and accused both accept the jurisdiction of the trial of fact, then the prior fact must listen to both the accuser and accused. Me, did I did, did I get mute muted? What? Sorry, we were having some te technical difficulties, so everyone got muted. Can you, you just oh. uh, repeat? I'm, I'm sorry about that. What was I saying the last thing? I'm sorry, I was struggling with the technology. If you just- uh... Uh, The accused and the accuser being acu uh, both accused equally. Thank you. Yeah, the, the accuser and accused must accept the trier of fact in, because you don't have compulsive jurisdiction. Do you know what I'm, what I'm saying? In other words, you don't have a court that can compel people so you must accept the, the legitimacy of this person as an investigator. 
or uh, these people as investigators. And the investigators must listen to the accused and accused, the accuser and accused, must consider witnesses, must consider circumstantial evidence. And the part that is rarely used, but I strongly believe in, is direct the oath, tawjih al-qasam. Because I'll tell you, if you take that oath and you are lying, that you, you are, you swear that you are saying the truth and may Allah curse you if you are not. My experience, anyone that has taken this oath untruthfully, their life has falls apart. Time and time again, experience has showed me that people who have taken this oath and lied about it, uh, God's vengeance is severe. Uh, this, uh, this is the process. But I mean, if if now if the the person, if the accused or the accuser don't accept the the legitimacy of prior of fact, then in this situation again, then you you fall upon the duty of precaution. Because there is, you, no one can conduct a proper investigation. You can't pretend, or oh, I'm going to deputize myself to investigate when the parties don't accept you as an investigator. Because you can't listen to both sides uh, in, under fair circumstances. So what happens when you are hampered from doing an investigation because the parties don't accept you as an investigator? So you can't listen to witnesses, you can't listen to both sides, you can't under controlled circumstance, then you fall upon the duty of precaution. Do I have enough evidence to now have an obligation to protect the public? Do, am I in a position where there is a risk that a member of the public might be hurt and then I would have to answer for that before Allah. It, it is, it's, 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 you know, when we, when we bring things back to the basic principles, we can do very rational things. The way Sharia works, it's, it's beautifully logical. It, it is because of the lack of competence and lack of training that you find Sharia do very weird things like you as just intuitively you even if you're not a lawyer you just say it just doesn't sound right it just doesn't seem to it, it, something is off and it, it, usually you're right uh, it, it is when, when sharia is doing very weird things it probably means that the people who are talking about sharia don't know what they're talking about. And because Sharia works in a wonderfully um, fair manner. The, the, the principle, it's like it, it, the, the principles of justice come together to produce justice, not to mimic justice. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question is Rami. Uh, my question is about um, the common thing that's brought up is giving the benefit of the doubt to the accused or whoever is, you know, being accused of committing a sin. So if people, you know, are using the benefit of the doubt as a shield, um, what, what basically, how does that play in from a, a perspective um, and balancing the rights of the accused and the accuser? Remember that the benefit of the doubt is there to protect us first and foremost, first and foremost against the state, against the state that has the power to impose criminal penalties. I, as an individual, need all types of protections against the state because the state is very powerful. The state can do a lot of, can throw me in prison, can 
flog, I mean, at least in medieval times, can flog you, can, you know, execute you. And the only thing that protects you against the state are our conception of rights. So that's the first thing that we need to remember. Second, is that Al-Asq al-Ashya al-Bara'a or Al-Asq al-Ashya al-Ibaha or Bara'a al-Zimma, all of these things that connote a presumption of you are innocent until otherwise. But aside from the state imposing a criminal penalty against you, let, let's take a, a scenario, and, and I think the answer becomes very, very obvious, okay? So let's say I, um, the, the state is considering whether to hire me for a job. And they go to my professors and my professors say, you know, yeah, he has good grades, but I've noticed that, you know, I suspect that he has good grades because he knows how to answer exams, but he really doesn't have the ability to analytically apply his knowledge to experiential situations. In other words, a negative recommendation. Do I have a right at that point to come and say, ah, presumption of innocence. How dare you not give me the job because I have the presumption. How can you take the opinion of my professors without first coming to me and saying, and then I can say, no. And, and we don't, we, we in, intuitively, know that, wait, you don't have a right to a presumption of innocence to obtain a job or to hold on to a job. Intuitively, we know that. So if I come, you know, someone applies for a job in my company or in my shop, and then I say, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want to hire you. Why don't you want to hire me? Well, to be honest, you know, I've heard that from some friends that you're a lazy worker. Ah, oh, how dare you? Presumption of innocence. You must give me the job. Presumption of innocence. We know intuitively. Doesn't work. We know because there's no criminal penalty. We know that there is no accusing state. We know that in the balance of rights, I can't use the presumption of innocence to either obtain an affirmative advantage. In, in other words, I can't use the presumption of innocence to affirmatively to obtain an advantage as opposed to defensively to defend myself against the possible criminal penalties. Now, this is, it, you, you take this situation. There is no criminal penalty. The issue is not criminal penalty. The issue to be very specifically whether you should continue on in a job, perhaps as an imam, or whether you should obtain an advantage by being invited to jobs, even if you're not paid for these jobs, but that imam to come as a speaker, whether you're paid or not, right? Now, the presumption of innocence, it, it, I could tell the person, I am not, saying that I actually know whether the accusations against you are right or wrong. And it is not my business to actually make that determination. But what I know is that enough of a doubt has been raised, a shubha, enough of a shubha has been raised in my mind to invoke wajib al to invoke the duty of precaution. So while I am not judging you as guilty or not guilty, I am not employing you as a speaker in my mosque. I am not inviting you as a speaker in my mosque. Even I am, even if I, if I have enough of cumulative evidence 
enough shubha. The shubha rises and rises. I could even terminate your job. Now, at what point is fair to terminate someone's job? I can't tell you that, but I can tell you that it must, as a matter of conscience, the shubha must be fairly strong. This is the way the principles of Sharia work. There's a huge difference between a state saying, I'm going to apply a criminal penalty against you, and I'm using that right to defend myself against the power of the state to punish me criminally. And my attempt to use the presumption of innocence to hold on to an advantage, a social or economic advantage in society. And here we deal with shubuhat and ihtiyat. This is, these are the principles of jurisprudence. So when someone comes with presumption of innocence, my response is often, listen, I am not deciding whether you are guilty or not guilty. All I'm deciding is I have enough of a shubha, enough doubt has been raised through complaints. And since I'm not in a position to say you're saying the truth or they're saying the truth, but I am in a position to act to protect to protect the rights of others. And with all due respect, again, I'm not convicting you. That's not what it's about, but I am acting to protect the rights of others. And this, this has to be very clear in our mind. You know, for someone to, to do that, if someone has, you know, there are people that I know that, you know, 30 years or 40 years of service and, and, and suddenly a voice comes out of the blue and accuses them of something. And if I look at it and do I have an obligation to, to, to know more? Well, it depends on whether I, I you know, if I'm just satisfied with curiosity, no. But if I'm deciding whether I want this person in my classroom, yes, I, I, I have an obligation to look more. So I look at it more and I discover that this person has filed a lawsuit demanding you know, half a million dollars. And you know, I do my due diligence a bit more and I find, I, I look up the, the law firm and I know it's one of the law firms that takes uh, you know, anyone uh, because they, they're a settlement law firm. You know, frankly, I don't put too much weight on that. Uh, but the same person, now I get, you know, three, four accusations. I say, hold on. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the chances that three, four women in different years are saying this person, and then when I look at what these women are saying, I find that they are describing fairly similar scenarios. You know, he told me you need, I'm going to give you special uh, counseling about, you know, your spirit, your, your raw, your whatever. And then we sat on the couch and he put his hand on my knee. And it, at some point, the wajib al ihtiyat kicks in. And and I'll tell you, I mean, again, with these individuals, I might not hire them to be in my classroom or invite them to give a lecture, but still they invite me to their home for dinner, I go. I say, well, why, why are you having dinner with me? I say, because I'm, I haven't judged that you were guilty. The, the individual that I'm talking about, there were two accusations. That's not what I said. but. The two accusations, when I looked at them, they were sufficiently by rational, balanced women that the duty of precaution kicked in. And I'm sorry, I, I can't, I, you know, although this person I actually had feelings for, although, you know, I, I you're a person that has been hard, close to my heart for all these years, but I can't hire you in, 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 in good conscience, not because I believe the accusations, but because I can't take that risk. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. I know uh, Rami also had a follow-up question uh, regarding forgiveness. Yeah, this is just related to um, many incidents where uh, women are pressured by family to forgive um, the perpetrator of an offense against them on the basis that, you know, forgiving an, is an Islamic obligation and you shouldn't hold hate in your heart. You know, uh, for, forgiveness is um, sometimes contrary to what a lot of people say. Forgiveness, when it is truly voluntary, it's healthy. But when forgiveness is a result of pressure, it adds to the sense of feeling wronged and to the sense of grievance and to pressure someone to 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 to, to forgive uh, um, i mean listen if oh, god sake if allah says la ikra la ikra fi al din min al ghayb yani if if allah re rejects compulsion in our the most basic issue and that is in faith a priori, any form of compulsion to forgive, you can you can advise the person, but to exercise pressure, you are damaging the person. If they forgive, uh, if they say I forgive, and they actually don't feel that they forgive, um, you just increase their sense of isolation, their sense of loneliness, their sense of um, and from experience, I'll tell you, I, I, in situations where women were confronted, especially, um, you know, in, especially in case of sexual abuse by family, and you must forgive, you must forgive, you must forgive. And it, what I've seen is that it results in 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 exactly it, it results in the following is, is that the person says i forgive to the family to please the family but then they spiral off um they take it out on themselves they hate themselves it's as if they hate themselves for saying i forgive and they take it out on themselves in many different ways, including uh, hostility to everything that reminds them of Islamic symbols, Islamic anything. And, and it's devastating. And then it's like, you know, you, you sit and you supplicate to Allah, who's to blame? I mean, who, do you, who has to answer for this? The, the, the abuser, the community, the, because this person has been severely damaged because they've never felt that there's anyone who understands or even can, is willing to understand. Um, and we can't be a community like that. We, 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 we have an affirmative obligation as a community to heal wounds. You know, if you have a wound, you would want people to help you heal it. And the Prophet Islam taught us that you treat your brother or your sister as you want to be treated. Thank you so much. Um, Marwa has another question. Um, if a victim experienced abuse and confides in her family, but is afraid to escalate the matter further to the public. Is she committing a sin? Well, okay. can you say this again? I have no time hearing you. you. Want me to repeat it? Yes. yes. I had hard time hearing you. Sorry, there, it's, there's two people in this room. Um, if a victim experienced abuse and confides in her family, but is afraid to escalate the matter further to the public, is she committing oh. a sin? Uh, you know, this is a really tough call. Um, 
because um, there, you know, yes, there is an obligation to to protect the public. Um, but um, I mean, first, the, the, um, okay. There, I've let's differentiate between situations because I think it's a world. First, re remember that we can't put upon a victim more than they can bear. We can't put the 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 responsibility of the entire ummah on on a victim because already they're, they're deeply injured by what they've gone through and then to destroy them even further. So that, that is a serious consideration. But then we look at individual circumstance. So you have a situation, for instance, where there's family abuse and uh, incest um, type sexual abuse. And then the, the victim, um, let's say told her husband, but hasn't come out in public. And I don't expect a victim because in the case of incest, it, it, the, the crime is usually directed against a family member, a member uh, a, a, who was in a very vulnerable position. But then if the woman tells me, I have now grandchildren, and I say, you have an absolute either you keep your grandchildren away from the abuser without explanation or you absolutely have an obligation because now the rights of the children are involved so let's say uh, take a real life situation you know someone who is a quran reciter or an imam and sexually assaulted a woman and you know, the woman confided in her family, um, but then the evidence points to that there will be, there has been, and there will be other victims who will fall prey to physical sexual, to, to the sexual assault. It is really important to To, to just tell the victim, oh, you must absolutely just go and take her all on your shoulder and expose this person in the world and suffer the consequences is, is uh, doesn't, but to shore up support, to, to work with the person and to talk about the obligation of protecting others and so that the person performs their obligation to protect other while at the same time knowing that they're supported by their family and it is, is essential. So, I mean, it's a, it's a tough balance, but every time I know that there's going to be continuing crime, there is an obligation to protect. But the, in the process of protecting, you can't destroy the um, uh, you, you you can't destroy the the already victimized person. Um, but I do invite women to think very seriously. I mean, if you think in good conscience that whatever you were exposed to is not something that's going to repeat itself and you want to keep it private then halas. but if you believe in good conscience that it is something that will repeat itself and that there will be other victims then I do very strongly invite them to think very seriously if they can handle uh, bringing an accusation um, or express to protect others because again, the obligation is to protect others. Um, 
But yeah, I, you know, Maro, it's, it's it's very hard because I I've seen, you know, I've seen um, um, you know, even when people get the, even when people have taken the very brave, like they've written a letter or something like that and named themselves, um. Our community has this tendency to gossip about the matter for a while and then to get bored with the gossip and the victim is completely forgotten and the person who uh, you know has occupied the status of authority to remain in whatever that that has been the trend so far Allah alam. Thank you so much. So we are approaching the three hour mark. May Allah bless you. Um, I just, I wanna close now with one last question. Um, you know, you spoke really powerfully in part one about healing and shared your own personal experiences. Um, and so I wanna close really, I mean, the, the question that I received was um, if you could speak directly to survivors, how do we heal? Um, what Islamic wisdom and guidance can you share on the path of spiritual healing? And of course, this is different from person to person, but any no. practical advice? So I wanted to give you that. And I, and I also wanted to just expand it because, it, you know, we talk about spiritual abuse. We talk about sexual abuse. You know, women are abused in many ways. Could be financial abuse, could be, you know, other emotional abuse. Um, and, you know, the, the outcome is the same, that feeling of, of helplessness and trauma and, you know, the need to heal. So I, you know, just wanted to even broaden, um, you know, the, the question of how, how do we heal from, from abuse in whatever form? I mean, you know, um, the, the, yes, you're right, so abuse generally, the 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 first step is the sense of there's always that sense of self hate um the sense of you 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 hate your weakness you hate your your uh stupidity you hate you know you, you blame yourself for all types of things and um and that is, it's it, the, the least constructive and healthy sentiment. In situations particularly of sexual abuse, the worst thing is that you hate your body or even particular parts of your body. And um, you're, you're just extremely uh, um, uncomfortable. Um, you get triggered by your body. Um, um, and that sense of alienation from your physical self um, is, again, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very brutal and it's very harsh and it's very painful. So the, the first step is to work, you know, whether to, to, to understand, and this is to internalize that you, if you've gone through this, Allah has allowed you to go through this. Allah didn't allow you to go through this so you can hate yourself. Allah allow you to go through this so you can empower yourself so that you can learn something to do something. That it is never the case that Allah, I don't accept for anyone that Allah hates me and Allah just wanted to see me, you know, trashed or, you know, humiliated. Um, and this is not just in, in even for torture survivors, you know. Um, if Allah allowed this to happen to me, then Allah wanted to teach me something about evil and about shaitan and about what shaitan can do. And, 
And Allah wanted to teach me this so that I can be empowered to serve a purpose. And it is this, to, to, I know shaitan comes and puts all types of doubts in your heart. Really, Allah you know, chose you for something? Why would Allah choose you? You're a loser. You're disgusting. You're, you, know, you can't get your act together about anything. But you fight this through worship Allah until yaqeen comes to you, until certainty comes to you. That you keep worshiping Allah and holding on to Allah until certainty comes to you from Allah that you are in fact dear and close to Allah. And that in fact you have been selected to learn through trauma. And then I don't look at the trauma as a curse. In fact, I look at the trauma as putting me in a special position to be a recipient of special gifts from Allah. Allah is going to give me special abilities because I went through special trauma. And the question becomes, okay, what is it that Allah wants me to do from the knowledge that came from that special trauma? This is the personal experience that I've had. I, I just couldn't accept that Allah would just want me to suffer, just to suffer. And I didn't want just the idea that, well, Allah will reward you in the hereafter and khalas and that's it. Uh, you know, I, 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 yeah, I, I, Allah will, if Allah rewards me, it's because of Allah's grace and Allah's mercy and Allah's kindness and Allah will forgive my sins, then that's what I pray for. But trauma had a reason. And the reason, if Allah allowed me to survive it, if Allah wanted me to reward me in the hereafter, Allah wouldn't have allowed me to survive it. But if Allah would be, allowed me to survive it, then Allah wanted me to learn from my trauma. And you fight shaitan, especially in the things that trigger you, that trigger your memory. And you just have to be very honest. I get triggered by it. And because I get triggered by these things, so for many times, for a long time, I would be, get triggered for a very long time. I would get triggered by male doctors. Uh, I couldn't stand a, a male doctor to touch me. As very, and you know that, Grace, uh, being married to me. Um, I, so I was very honest with myself. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'll be very honest. That's what I'm triggered by. And uh, I will insist on a female doctor because that's what I need to heal. And alhamdulillah, now female or male doctors don't bother me. It's a long road to recovery, but you have to believe in Allah's belief in you because you will not have the wherewithal to believe in yourself. But you, you have to have the wherewithal to believe in Allah's belief in you. Allah wouldn't choose you to suffer if Allah didn't want you to learn from that suffering, to do something beyond yourself. That's the, the best advice I can give people. And uh, are we closing? Yes, we are closing. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, then I, I, can, I just want to emphasize something that we started with because I am deeply, deeply, deeply concerned about this. People, there is a very real danger. I am extremely worried about pornography and the hijab fetish. I am deeply worried about pornography and the Muslim fetish. I... I know of men who make it a point, the number of Muslim women who contact me and say, 
I'm in love with an unmuslim man and I want to marry a Muslim man. And it, it, it deeply troubles me that the, that the post-war period has left a significant number of people with a Muslim or a hijab fetish. But I am much more troubled and we need to, to, to turn our attention to this very serious problem. Incest and pornography and the way that it is affecting families, especially conservative closed families. I am seeing an increased number of violations between brother and sister, cousins, um, it's just God awful things. And Muslims are absent from so many things, but um, putting our head, I mean, putting our head in the sand and I, I one of the things I learned that, that, that just is deeply troubling, do you know that the Muslim world is among the percentage-wise, the highest pornography consumers in the world? And the pornography sites will often have English and Arabic. Not, not Hebrew, not French, not Portuguese, not Spanish, English and Arabic. Um, this is something that, that really um, our psychologists, uh, I don't know uh, who, psychologists and sociologists, I guess, and leave alone lawyers. I mean, why is, is, is this type of very damaging, it's more damaging than terrorism, for definitely. Why is this type of pornography protected by the First Amendment? When I tell Muslim lawyers, you should consider that your obligation to, to affect change, like a change like that. You know, people look at me like I'm crazy, like as if, well, you know, we just want to make a living as lawyers and get good corporate jobs. No, I, I don't think so. I think if you're if you're a Muslim and a lawyer, uh, and especially if God made you made you a talented lawyer, we need to do something to protect society from these evils. Anyway, absolutely. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. God bless you, Sheikh. I know you've had already a very long day and a three-hour session is really exhausting, but I think that what you shared with us was absolute gold. And I pray that um, anyone who is listening to this will benefit and have um, enlightenment, um, empowerment, and you know, good help in healing and starting that journey. Um, so thank you everyone who um, participated, who stayed with us, who asked questions, who sent questions. Um, may Allah you know, bless and protect you all. And um, you know, I'm looking forward to our, hopefully our publication of the proceedings from part one and part two. Um, keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, also wanna encourage you to get um, our book, The Prophet's Pulpit, which is again, empowerment in a book. Um, and um, you know, inshallah, um, spread the word because I, I think what we do here is really special and um, you know I, I want more people to know about it. Um, it's it's a source of, of light and um, a source of beauty. So um, despite all the challenges. So thank you everyone um, and I hope you have a wonderful week and we will look forward to seeing you inshallah um, hopefully at our khutbah on Friday or our halakha next week or a future event inshallah. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>